Hey everybody, so welcome to the Summer 2024 Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase where I review some of the new tools out there in the Knowledge Graph space. I do this completely on my own. I have no relationship with any of the companies that I review. I get no sponsorships, I get no kickbacks, I get nothing. Uh, I do this because I like to see what new tools are out there and see what they're all about. And it seems like all of you appreciate being able to also see those uh, and not necessarily have to reach out to the salespeople right away or get more of a biased view from the vendor themselves. And I forgot to film which tool we are going to be reviewing today. So that one, that's the one that we're going to be reviewing today. If you're wondering where I am, there's another video coming on that soon. Uh, but also make sure you stick around to the very end of the video because my honest review is written up at the very end and throughout the whole process, I ask questions as we go and hopefully that helps you if you're interested in this. If not, at least it's entertaining, hopefully. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, let's go get started. Quick introduction uh, to myself. Uh, Yerke, currently CTO at ArangoDB. And previously I've been doing, yeah, data uh, systems, data analytics uh, for the past, well, over 17 years. I always feel the hair takes a bit of my age, which is good. <laughs> uh, from a certain age onwards. Mm -hmm. um, so um, basically it started a long time ago uh, with a PhD on distributed database systems after that was quickly over at SAP. And then uh, back at uh, Mesosphere, um, we actually built a lot of the kind of like data infrastructure for uh, large, large enterprises out there, including Netflix, uh, Airbnb and, uh, and others. And this is, uh, this is why I actually really like my role right now because I can pull in all those different things. So I kind of wanted to highlight, especially considering in the realm, um, like how do we simplify things? What is new? Maybe just as a quick reminder, if you haven't seen the other video, OrangoDB is basically an open, open source uh, database uh, out there focused on graph. If I say focused on graph, it actually means uh, we can even do more than graph. So if I try to explain it, I often explain like, uh, imagine MongoDB uh, uh, and a graph database and Lucene or Elasticsearch, they ended up at a party. And nine months later, you get that cute little database system. I love that would it. Kind of, that would kind of be, be a RangoDB. So I think first, first and foremost, we are we are a graph da uh, database. Uh, also, just in terms of like scalability decisions and engineering decisions we take. But if if you look uh, overall, um, a graph database will only be a small part in the overall system. I think you mentioned you mentioned that example early as well. You might still need a record where you need to retrieve uh, individual items. So I think there you can also just treat it as as a document. Uh, database out there. The other thing is also you can use it as a full-blown uh, search uh, or full-text retrieval engine or information mm -hmm. retrieval engine. So on top of that, we also have like our graph analytics, uh, graph algorithms library, and what we'll talk about as well, we have our graph machine learning out there. Uh, we will roll out our free tier for our um, uh, Arango graph. Oh, uh, man, stuff. that's awesome. I mean, especially for those that are in the research community, like, you know, trying to get funding for something like this, you know, at a massive scale is, is not always easy. Yeah. And I mean, if you have a research project, uh, we have multiple examples in the community. Please feel free to reach out because uh, there we are quite generous in also providing like larger deployments and work even working together with you. So we have multiple examples of that. So if you have something, please, please reach out. I want to highlight some of the things which I think simplify uh, access to graph. So I think the first thing is just uh, like loading your data. We introduced like a new uh, data loader where you can actually just visually design your graph schema. Because I think this is right. also one of the big, this is one of the big challenges for a lot of people getting started yeah. with graph. Uh, but this is basically, uh, we have uh, Jupyter Notebooks as part of the platform. Mm -hmm. um, those of you who might not be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, it's a very standard tool for like any data scientist out mm -hmm. there. And uh, I think what makes it special, it, this is running like in the same scope as the system. So it's, it's still like, it's secure data. You're not getting your data out of the platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it gives you like a very easy way to ex explore your data sets. Uh, we have a Rango RDF, which is kind of a bridge between nice. uh, property graphs, ontologies, and and uh, and and yeah, 
uh, Rangu to be in the end. Uh, yeah, let, let's actually let's actually get get to a demo here. Yeah. Uh, so this is publicly available. So this is uh, our Langchain integration. So if you either Google a Rangu to be Langchain or just look mm -hmm. at the Langchain in integration page, you'll even come up with with this notebook. And this is all about uh, what we said earlier. Like how can you uh, kind of separate the explicit storage being stored in this case in a RangoDB together with the natural language capabilities of your favorite LLM out there. So here we're mm -hmm. using uh, OpenAI. Uh, I mean, this is something which actually impressed us ourselves, like mm -hmm. um, Chat uh, GPT, even 3.5, uh, 4.0, even more. We're pretty impressive in yeah. generating. Uh, even AQL queries from natural language which is what we are looking at here. Um, for for this demo, I'll kind of like skip over uh, most of that, but uh, the mm -hmm. setup, you can also learn a little bit about uh, uh, Langchain itself if you haven't done so. Uh, but I think the, the interesting part itself is then uh, when, when we can query uh, graphs. So I've already loaded all the data sets. And uh, so we can now run queries and I'll explain how that relates to hallucination in just a second. So for example, yeah. here, who are the two youngest characters in Games of Thrones? So this is all kind of like related to Games of Thrones. We have the graph of that preloaded. And again, this is kind of like publicly uh, available. So if you just want to rerun that uh, yourself, go in and do it. And what we can see, so I've kind of like the full, full blown output here um, mm -hmm. is what the LLM will do, it will translate uh, my natural language query into like an AQL query out mm -hmm. here. And I think mm -hmm. this is what we said earlier. People don't have to learn that anymore. It yeah. just really gives gives us like a re result out there. And then it actually turns that result into an, a natural language uh, answer uh, we can provide nice. to users. And I think this helps us to counter hallucinations in two different ways. First of all, as we are relying on the explicit data and not the probabilistic data in an LLM, yeah. uh, we can actually, uh, yeah, uh, reduce, minimize hallucinations by that already quite a bit. Second yeah. part is, as I can really provide a backtrace to the information yeah. I've retrieved. So yeah. in domains such as finance, healthcare, I think this yeah. is also critical Very kind of that important. answer. Uh, the question, uh, should I use a vector? Is, is a vector database going to replace everything out there? And I strongly believe not, uh, simply yeah. because I, uh, if I have an explicit data store, so which is maintained, right? So uh, either even through LLMs or through some experts, I'm maintaining my knowledge graph. This is an entity which can be independently verified. If I have exactly. my vector stores, or even with the backtrace, it seems like, oh, this vector contributed to your answer. Okay, great. Uh, doesn't really help, right? But yeah. if I basically get a subgraph or something I can look yes. at, and exactly. which can be independently verified, I think this exactly. is a very strong suit why exactly. I believe vector stores are not going to replace everything. As, yes. as a kind of like, as, as a theme throughout our talk, use the right tool for the right job and vector exactly. stores are probably exactly. the right tool for a lot of uh, different things out here. But um, having a verifiable knowledge representation yeah. is something very powerful, uh, especially in 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 domains where where it matters quite a lot. Quick, quickly, ju jumping back here, um, you, we can also deal with more complex things. So, for example, like uh, are two two persons related? And if I'm not mistaken, this should actually yeah, this should transform in, into a graph graph traversal out there. Mm -hmm. And I think this is. Uh, this is the interesting piece where uh, it's not just a simple queries out there, but we can also generate quite complex queries. So if you go through the notebook, you will also see like Arango search queries, uh, et cetera, being used. The one thing I kind of want to uh, make everyone aware about is that large language models, they are not like the, the magic solution to everything. So we actually, uh, we have done prompt engineering here um, and we also are playing with like our own fine tuned models, but uh, it's, it's never gonna work like all out of the box. So you should still be a bit uh, care careful out there exactly. with the results. But for example, like let's take like one concrete example here where uh, uh, like, the base model uh, will will fail by itself. And uh, if I recall, that's a GPT 3.5 uh, here. Uh, so for example, here uh, it says like, oh no. And this is because it's actually putting an outbound in, in here, okay? 
we can do that uh, with simple prompt engineering by just saying like, hey, just remember to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember to use inbound and we get the right result. Obviously, we don't want to modify like all our queries like that. Yeah. So where LLMs are super powerful at, they're so-called like one short or few short learners. So if I simply provide like one example, and uh, this can be done in our uh, LangChain integration by just providing like one example here, uh, like kind of like the text you want to translate to which query, uh, but then the system is actually very good at generalizing from it, right? Yeah. So here we provided our, our examples and it will actually, um, kind of like generalize it, not just to the exact uh, question we've provided here, but also to other people out here. So it will actually uh, recognize that pattern out there is a uh, similarity search. Uh, so find similar nodes, uh, for example, or find similar subgraphs. And that would, for example, if you if you want to find like a text on, on your interaction graph and like a network interaction graph, you want to find similar patterns uh, or similar nodes in similar contexts, finding otherwise also influences in a social network. You give it some examples and then you just want to find similar nodes uh, to that. Yeah, I mean, let's let's maybe take take a co concrete example there. And that's, uh, I think, like ent entity re resolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, where you try to find um, similar nodes and try to to group them together. Mm -hmm. and, and I always see that with my name. Like I have a German umlaut in my name. Living with an umlaut in your name in US, trust me, it's not fun because you basically always have to misspell your name. And even yeah. Lufthansa at check-in, they will mess that up. So you kind of need a system to figure out like, hey, York is written just with J-O-E-R-G or J-O-R-G. Or even if you have the umlaut, J-O-R-G are all referring to the same person. Mm -hmm. I don't have a single ID number. I don't have a single telephone number because I got a German and US one, uh, et cetera. So there isn't like one single piece of identifying information. Mm -hmm. So kind of that entity resolution, that similarity, that node similarity, uh, that actually needs to come from the context around. So you're basically doing kind of like a context merge. Yeah. And I think this is something which is also applicable to, for example, like cyber uh, crime, uh, where yep. you try to identify similar attacks, um, yep. or also the, the opposite, right, where you try to find anomalous behavior, so something which is not similar, which I just feel is kind of like the opposite of uh, similarity search. And I think the, the kind of last UDF-like operation um, from a database perspective is then link prediction. You try yeah. to, as you know from like LinkedIn, you try to predict like a, a link, uh, link, link out there. Like recommendation uh, of, yeah. of sorts. Like exactly, like recommendation. So here we actually like have a supply chains and supply chains, as you probably can imagine, they are connected data. Uh, we have different locations. We have different steps in, in our product cycle. So uh, if you want to figure out what is the impact of a ship being stuck in Suez Canal on, on your final product out there, uh, or you want to find replacements, uh, this is a very powerful tool. So this is a very elaborate notebook uh, to kind of like explain everything. But in yeah. the end, we want to kind of like uh, predict whether a ship, a new shipment will be late, uh, given given on all the input around, given given all the context uh, around that. And so uh, we we can go through, I'll try to focus on kind of like the, the highlight parts uh, here, but it's basically like from uh, creating a new project for that source data, different experiments. So uh, for example, what we do for you, we actually train not just one model for you, we actually train a number of different models for you and then we select the best one or even give you the option to override our default choice here. In, in those experiments, uh, we will actually create uh, and train multiple models for you. And then you can select which model you actually want to leverage for your prediction. So in this ta uh, task, it would be like, hey, label all unlabeled nodes with a ship late delivery, whether it's uh, suspected to be delayed or not. And this is then when you're applying a model out there. Uh, you also have uh, an option right now, it's a bit manual working together with us, Bas basically provide your own models coming in. So if you have a data nice. science team, but you want to make it accessible to the database users out there, right? Again, we are talking about connecting to worlds uh, to follow up on our scene here. Um, and uh, so uh, you can bring that in and then it's basically accessible as this user-defined function, just label all, all my other notes uh, out here. 
But let's actually quickly go through. I think in terms of time, I, I ran it before, but again, this is just available for, for everyone there. And it's it's actually pretty so simple steps out there. So first thing you do, you actually just uh, create uh, your own uh, project uh, or you retrieve an existing project if you want to yeah. keep working on it. Um, you uh, import and you connect to your database. And then we, we can basically jump in. So here we've set up our graph. Uh, we, we can now jump over just to, to RangoDB here and look into that. But it's basically just as we've seen before, just, just in the same graph. And we have different uh, no touch, different features. Uh, we then also generate for it. Here's a shipping feature, a uh, customer feature out there. And with that, we actually now want to do machine learning in context, right? So we actually uh, go in and first thing we do is we create a training uh, specification. So uh, easiest thing is uh, what are our input features here? Uh, ship feature X, uh, what is our target collection? Uh, we, we are working with this is shipping because it's shipping data is obviously stored in that shipping collection out there. And then which field do we want to label? And I think uh, this even ties back to what we discussed earlier about like JSON and non-JSON, where mm -hmm. uh, this is actually just a JSON field in the end, uh, which we're gonna gonna write for you. Uh, you give us uh, a kind of uh, me meta graph, right? So this is mm -hmm. the same. You can either use an existing graph. You can tell us like uh, create that on the fly. And then you just start your, your training task. Yeah. And what that uh, training task uh, will do, it will actually generate a number of different models in, in the background uh, you, you can choose from. So... Um, and then this is basically where either then the data scientist comes uh, in again and chooses mm -hmm. the best out of those models. So we have some heuristics, which model to choose. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as said here, you can actually choose the best model based on your domain knowledge. So for example, here, we just gonna uh, we just gonna rank them basically by the accuracy uh, on on the validation accuracy, and if you don't give us a a anything more, we'll just pick uh, the best the best model based on that. But mm -hmm. you, you can also do do more. So for example, uh, uh, you can go in a more detailed analysis, look at confusion matrix, like in, in many scenarios, you actually have different preferences. Uh, you can also even uh, ingest during training. Do I actually care about false positives uh, more than I care about missed exactly. ones, et cetera. So you can actually uh, kind of like uh, very much uh, uh, tailor that also like where where's your cost function for mis mispredictions yeah. out there? Or like I you know I was talking to a statistician recently um, and that works in economics and I was talking about false negatives and he's like you know what do you use that for? A, a, a lot of people um, I know what it is but why do people mm -hmm. use it? And I said well think about mm -hmm. it from a medical perspective. If you give a, yeah. a, a false negative, it means that if someone does actually have cancer you don't know that, right? Because it's a false yeah. or negative that you're saying that they don't and, actually have it. And and I think in in different domains, you actually have different biases for yes. for different errors. Uh, mm -hmm. Like uh, I think this one well, one of the first ones is always just like imagine you have a uh, uh, defense system. You're trying to predict like uh, like back in World War II, is someone attacking you? Uh, yeah, and there obviously you want to rather have like a, a, a false a positive rather than okay. safer uh, error, than error sorry. on the other side yeah. e exactly so but on the other hand if you overdo it and you always <laughs> just send everyone to the bunkers then it's also not it's, not going to exactly, work exactly exactly it's the thresholds for your business in yeah. this case. Um, and then you can apply it uh, to, to your data set. So this is then about inference or predictions. And uh, again, uh, you can trigger a job to run it over the entire database. There's also a new interface uh, coming out soon where you can just give us like a new data set coming, a uh, new data point coming in mm -hmm. and we'll uh, do that as well. And uh, this is basically uh, how you can utilize it uh, after that as just those user-defined functions, right? Yep. It is a trained machine learning model in the background, but you don't have to worry about training it. You don't have to mm -hmm. worry about maintaining it. You can just focus then on applying it. Yeah. And the same yeah. things uh, are, are, are coming up for node similarity. Similar things are, are coming up for, uh, yeah, link prediction. Predict all the missing edges in your LinkedIn user graph uh, uh, where you want to connect people. So 
I actually wanted to go, this was a super simple example on the supply chain. We actually have mm -hmm. a more uh, complex example on heterogeneous data, but I think mm -hmm. as we already have so much, I probably won't go through it. But that's just, as I said, like that's just a bit more complex graph uh, where uh, we uh, we use like, the GDELT uh, data project about like uh, world news uh, of like bad, yeah. usually bad events uh, happening. Let, 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 let's try to combine everything we, we just talked about together. So I think it's about simplifying access, simplifying those superpowers of connected data. And what we are seeing is kind of like the ground layer. There's a graph database. I can have simple uh, graph queries on top, like a simple traversal, et cetera. And I think a lot of people are already using that. Yeah. Still, this is, for example, where the LLMs are coming in, helping us to simplify access to those query capabilities. I think then typically that next level and happy to talk about it in yet another video is uh, our is graph analytics on top. Yeah. We have graph algorithms getting deep insights out of graph. Yeah. And then for me, that next step is kind of machine learning. And mm -hmm. I, I sometimes feel there's like a blurry line in between, but I think the yeah. big yeah. difference for me is machine learning. I actually have like a probabilistic pre-trained yeah. model where I split my training phase and then I generalize it in, in such pre-trained model on, on top of like exactly. new data. And I think just where all of us, not just we at Arangu, where all of us uh, come together is actually building smart solutions on top of that. So where I think it's actually like more than just all the technical capabilities uh, out there is uh, making this power uh, accessible for building smart solutions mm -hmm. for uh, yeah, leveraging our graph superpowers out here.